and uh, the manager of the uh, Port of Lewiston. Um, as such, you know, I'm an advocate for the Port of Lewiston, and I'm an advocate for the Columbia Snake River system. Uh, I'm not a biologist. I'm not an economist. So, you know, if you want to get into the grass and, and start, you know, discussing biology and, and, you know, some of the details and economics, you know, I'm not your guy. But as far as a general overview, I've, I've served as a manager 23 years during that time period. You know, I've been involved in the, the salmon and dam issue for 23 years. So, you know, you're, you're bound to pick up a few things during that time period. Uh, a lot of what's on my uh, presentation today, I've got some handouts over here along the side. So a lot of the, the uh, data that uh, my presentation comes from is the data that's uh, along on the handouts. And that's, you know, from the federal agencies or from biologists or, you know, somebody that's a heck of a lot smarter than I am on, on a lot of this stuff. So uh, just uh, for a clarification, you know, where, where's the Port of Lewiston's position uh, on dam breaching and, and to just, you know, come out is that, you know, the, the uh, extinction of salmon and steelhead is not an option, period. But we believe that dams and salmon co can coexist. We don't believe this is an either-or scenario, that you can have both dams and fish. And I hope as we go through this today, after hearing you know, what Joe has to say, what I have to say, you know, at least, you know, come out with a better understanding or, you know, uh, an appreciation for the complexity uh, of this issue. So the first slide that I've got is just the, the salmon life cycle, and it's a comprehensive kind of all-age approach on, on, uh, on salmon. And for, for those, uh, the, the four H's are harvest, <coughs> habitat, hatcheries, and hydro. And those four H's have to do with kind of the, the different, uh, you know, elements of, a, of the salmon's life cycle. But I'm just going to go through this quickly and then just kind of impart where salmon mortality occurs in each one of, one of these areas. And, and again, these numbers aren't mine. Uh, these numbers come from John McKern. He was a fisheries biologist with the Corps of Engineers for over 30 years. Um, and there's a paper of his again along the side that you can get it you know dive into these numbers if you want to you know you might be able to argue you know if the numbers are exact or not but i can tell you they're in the ballpark so starting out if you have two spring chinook salmon and they spawn in the snake river and let's say they spawn you know downstream of the hell's canyon complex so when, when they spawn you have about five thousand eggs in a, in a salmon red so as they grow become fried and smolt and get to the point over here where they're going to start their migration now on the Columbia and Snake River system. You start out with 5,000 eggs. By the time they begin to start their migration through the, the river system, you're now down to 2,000 smolt that are actually going to be making that trip. So we've lost, you know, 96% of, you know, those original eggs as the smolt that are going to migrate. But that's just due to nature. I mean, there's no, no, uh, um, dams or anything involved here. This is just why there are 5,000 salmon eggs to begin with. There's a lot of mortality that occurs. So as we go then from, you know, as we go through the river system then, and now we're in this hydro system passage area, and we're starting out again, remember, with, with 200 fish, and survival at each dam is approximately 96% survival at each dam. So you got eight dams, so it's, you know, 96 to the eighth power, so you're, you're down to 72% survival as you go, go through the hydro system. So you start with 200. By the time you get down below Bonneville Dam now, you've gone from 200 fish to 143 fish that are, are left. And now you're below Bonneville Dam, but now you're going to get through the estuary before you get to, to the ocean. So you start out here now with 143 fish, and you, and you move through the estuary through this area. And you've got things like Caspian terns and seals that are eating fish in this area. And you're going from 143 fish to 100 fish. So when you get to the mouth of the Columbia River out here into the ocean, you're left with a with a uh, hundred uh, smolt that are surviving. Now you get into the, the ocean where fish spend approximately 80 percent of their their life cycle. And you again, you know, what happens in nature: abundance of food in the ocean, harvest, predation. You go from 100 uh, fish to when, you, when the uh, adults begin to return, you're down to 12. So now you've got 12 fish that are going to begin the migration back for spawning. So now again, you, you start through the estuary, 
And again, now you've got sea lions and, and, and that are there and, and seals that are, you know, when they start that migration, it's like the dinner bell going off. You know, they're waiting there for, for these fish to show up. And so you go from 12 fish to five by the time they get to Bonneville Dam. And now they are going to go through the, through the eight dams again on the Columbia and the, and the state. The migration going up the river, you've got fish ladders that they go through. And, and a lot of the issues on dams have more to do with smolts going down than the adults returning. But, uh, but you still have uh, mortality in, that, uh, in this when they're migrating back. So you go from five fish to four. And so now you're, you're back to the confluence, we'll say, of down here at Lewiston and Clarkston. And, and out of that, you know, 5,000 eggs that started, you're down to four fish that have made it back to the confluence in, in Lewiston and Clarkston and then swimming now to the tributaries to, to spawn. Well, just due to the rigors and everything of the trip, you're going to go from four fish to two that are going to, going to perish just, you know, they're tired and they don't make it. And so now you're down to two fish that are left to spawn. So throughout this whole salmon life cycle, throughout here, you have started with 5,000 eggs, you know, 4,998 have perished. That's 99.96%. The, uh, the mortality that's occurred due to the hydro system is approximately 57 smolts traveling downriver and one adult returning. And so my point being is that there's you know, mortality throughout the salmon's life cycle in, the, in all four H's. And to think that we're just going to, to focus on one area, the hydro system passage, and that's going to be the silver bullet that's going to bring about salmon recovery I think it's pretty naive on, on our part that this is going to be the one thing that's going to do it. I think that you know we we have to concentrate on an all H approach and look at ways to reduce mortality throughout that salmon's life cycle than to just say we're going to concentrate on these dams and that's going to take care of everything. So um, why is there such a focus on dams? Well, to begin with, you know, dams are a pretty easy target. You know, they're great big pieces of concrete. You know, sitting in these uh, beautiful rivers, and you know, so they're they're easy to, to identify. You know, they definitely harm, and you know, they kill fish. Um, they're kind of a you know a good celebrity cause too. I mean, if you're out raising money in an environmental group to show a you know a sea lion eating a salmon, doesn't really you know it's hard to raise money based on that. You know, or if you're you know got a picture of the ocean, and you know, that's where mortality occurs. But you know, you've got a picture of a dam out there, it's a lot easier way to point to something that you know, is a good way to be able to raise money. Also, there are massive uh, uh, public investment that's going on with these. Um, it's the, the largest wildlife program in the nation, frankly, if not the world, of what's going on, that what we're doing to bring about salmon and steelhead recovery. 15 to 20 percent of your power bill is attributed to fish and wildlife programs. We've spent over $16 billion to date in salmon and steelhead recovery. And it's a cottage industry. I mean, there's a lot of people whose job, a lot of attorneys whose job it is, to keep litigating this issue and having to move forward. I mean, you could say partially part of my jobs could be attributed to this too and, and what's going on. But, you know, this is an industry and there's a lot of money being spent and, you know, that perpetuates. So, where are we at today? In, in this issue. Back in May of 2016, Judge Simon uh, ruled and he struck down biological opinion. I mean, completely uh, struck this thing down. And ordered a redo of the a biological opinion. Now, the biological opinion is what's used to kind of govern how the, the Columbia Snake River is operated and to ensure uh, survival or, uh, of the salmon and steelhead runs to make sure we're, we're getting harvestable. Uh, recoverable numbers. And so um, bi biological opinion is, is, a, is a redo and he's ordered a, a new environmental impact statement to, to be done. And right now you may be familiar with you know the, the scoping for that environmental impact statement is underway. Comments are due like February 7th so still have a chance to get your comments in if you need to and, and that's important because when the environmental impact statement uh, is done, no matter which side of the issue on it, uh, that you're on of this, you need to get those comments in because when the draft of this comes out, of this environmental impact statement comes out four years from now, you say, why wasn't this study? 
Well, it's because nobody asked the question. So, I mean, we, it's important that we all get our questions in that we want to see addressed in this environmental uh, impact statement. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out, too, is that, you know, this, you know, a lot of the information I'm going to give you right now has to, is going to focus on the Snake River dams. But what's important on this EIS is it's all 14 dams on the hydro system. So this goes from Bonneville all the way to Hungry Course in Montana. This isn't a focus on the four lower Snake River dams. This uh, EIS is going to focus on um, um, all 14 dams on the uh, federal hydropower system. Um, last thing, just to point out here, and the judge agreed that, that with this, there's a, been talk that, you know, because there isn't enough salmon coming out of the, the river system that somehow this is endangering orcas, and the judge, you know, disagreed with this and said, no, that isn't the case, there's plenty of fish, and that's not causing, you know, any problems with the orcas. So, uh, some of the um, energy facts. Uh, these dams are emissions-free, it's renewable power, it's reliable, and this power is available at a moment's notice. You know, when we all go to turn on your coffee maker in the morning, you know, these dams can dial up and meet that power load instantaneously. They do provide, you know, the, anywhere between 3 and 5% of the region's uh, energy, but more importantly, they provide 30% of the capacity. And, you know, what is that, you know, it kind of sounds like 5% of the, of the uh, generating capacity. It kind of makes it sound like if we all turn off one light bulb in our house, you know, we'll be able to conserve that amount of energy. Well, that's equal, you know, that amount of energy is equal to a city of the size of Seattle. You know, or another way it'd be, you know, if you put Boise and the Tri-Cities and Spokane together. Or another way you can look at it yet is if you took all the residential homes in Idaho and Montana, these, these, Snake River dams produce enough energy for all residential homes in Idaho and Montana. So this isn't an insignificant amount of power that we're talking about that these dams produce. They're a critical cog in the Northwest energy grid. They help meet peak energy needs, they stabilize the grid, and they're 25% of EPA's operating revenues. Some admission facts. These dams have no carbon and no measurable methane emissions. Uh, the energy output cannot be replaced by wind and solar. You would have to have some kind of a gas, you know, more likely to be gas turbine generation if you were to take these dams out. It's just, you know, you have to have that base load production out there. So if you were going to then, re, you know, replace that with uh, a gas uh, turbine combustion to reproduce that power, it would add 4 million tons of carbon every year. That's like putting 800,000 cars on the road. And again, in fact, that's just what, you know, these dams allow us, this bait load is what allows us to have wind and solar. You know, solar's not such a big thing in the Northwest, you know, with the sunshine here, but especially with our wind production, though. And that, that's why we're able to have the, the growth that we're seeing in our wind production, because you have that base load. It is a, a river highway uh, created by the locks and dam system. If you were to take this off, as part of what Joe was talking about, you'd be putting over 43,000 additional rail cars would be necessary, or 167,000 trucks on the road. And if you look at, at what these uh, dams provide, they keep the region's uh, carbon footprint as half of what it would be in other areas of, of the U.S. producing energy. So just on navigation and commerce, uh, the dams are part of a 465-mile system. And the system works t in together. It's not, you know, just get rid of the Snake River dams and don't worry that you'd still have transportation on the lower end of the system. It's not. I mean, you need the whole thing working together to be able to provide the amount of cargo necessary to make the whole thing work. In 2014, barges carried about 4.4 million tons, worth about $1.5 million in cargo. Um, another thing to point out here uh, that's there's been a lot of, I've heard it several times when I've heard, heard uh, groups talk, environmental groups talk, and down here that uh, the claim that uh, the Snake River system is neg negligible use, uh, you know, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, that claim has absolutely no validity whatsoever. And the, the truth of it is, is that according to the Corps of Engineers, this is a medium-use river system, period. There is no such thing, no, even no such category as a negligible use. Uh, the Columbia State River System is the nation's top wheat export gateway, and nearly 10% of our wheat uh, travels on the 
uh, let me just say, uh, just through the Snake River dams. A few of the fish facts. Um, ladders allow returning adults to move past the dams, as we pointed out, kind of in that uh, salmon life cycle. Um, and we do have state-of-the-art fish passion systems for downstream, you know, what's referred to as fish, what I have up here, we've spent almost $2 billion on fish slides, or they're referred to as uh, surface collector systems, which allow the, the, the salmon to just, you know, kind of slide over the top of the dam and be able to bypass the dam with very high survival rates, 96, 97 percent survival utilizing uh, surface collectors. Our, our returns are up and, you know, the variance that you're seeing year to year has more to do with ocean, ocean conditions than what's going on with, uh, you know, with dams or uh, dam mortality issues. So as I said, uh, survival's up. You know, here's what uh, survival percentages look like at, at each of the dams. Abundance is up. So this is a graph. This is combining uh, salmon and steelhead uh, returns going back to, to 1938. And this is taken at, at Bonneville Dam. And, and to point out here, in, in 1938, that's when you could actually start counting fish. Before then, you know, you didn't have a, a dam there when fish go by that you could make counts. So in, in 1900, we had 50 canneries on the lower Columbia River. I mean, by 1900, we had decimated our salmon and steelhead runs because we harvested and canned them. And, and we had less than half a million fish returning in, in 1938. So as you go through uh, 1938, you know, this is what construction's going on in the lower Columbia River in this area. The Snake River dams were going in kind of the late 60s, mid 70s in here. You know, uh, navigation came to Lewiston in 1975. <laughs> and, you know, from this point, you know, there was a dip in here and, and another spike and that's, and the $16 billion worth of investment that we put in for, for salmon and steelhead improvements has gone in over this period and we're starting to see the results of that investment. And from 2000 roughly, we've been seeing, you know, steady, re, you know, increases in our salmon and steelhead returns. Now, if you, you know, listen to a lot of environmental groups out there right now, you'd expect this, you know, this not to be going up, but doing the other, you know, going the other direction and headed down. Now, a lot of these returns are, are associated with hatchery fish, and so there are issues with native fish out there, but you know, I'm just gonna say right, you know, as far as my opinion of that, to find a genetically pure, uh, you know, salmon or, or sealhead runs anymore, it's getting pretty darn tough to do. I mean, unless you're in the Potlatch River or uh, the Asotan Creek or something like that, I mean, you've got hatchery fish that are commingled uh, with uh, uh, native fish. Um, you've got hatchery programs that you no longer clip out of post fins on, fit, uh, fins on, so it's very difficult to say, yeah, okay, I've got a genetically pure uh, fisher anymore. Some of the costs on uh, breaching dams, first of all, only Congress can authorize the funds and removal of the dams. Breaching costs range anywhere from 1.3 to 2.6 billion. If you're going to then replace that power <coughs> output, you're going to go to gas cogeneration. The cost per year is anywhere from 274 to 372 million per year. So you have massive uh, costs, higher carbon emissions to replace margin. Yeah, transportation of goods. Where is the Northwest opinion on this? Uh, this was an opinion survey that was done in, in 2015. Seventy percent of people agree that dams are critical to the Northwest energy picture, and 77 percent agree that dams and fish should coexist. This morning in the Lewiston paper in the sound off, it was about 12 to 1. <laughs> Um, there's, there's been, uh, you know, dams have been removed, Elwan Conduit Dam, and there's been a lot of, you know, drawing parallels, well, by gosh, we can take Elwan Conduit out, why can't we take out the Snake River Dams? And I just say, you know, there's a heck of a lot of difference between taking out a low head dam, such as Elwa Dam, and that had produced a, a minimal amount of power, and they had no salmon passage uh, associated with it, you know, there's no navigation or uh, associated with it, versus a Snake River Dam, you know, these, you know, uh, I, I always get a kick out of uh, you know, the reference by a lot of environmental groups to these, you know, antiquated old dams. Well, these Snake River Dams are some of the most modern dams in the world. 
with the investments that have gone into them. So you know, by uh, any stretch of the imagination, these are some of the most modern, uh, efficient dams out you know, in, the, in the world today. <coughs> so um, just you know, kind of wrapping this up in conclusion, uh, salmon survival on the dams vastly improved with new technologies. You know, you're never going to have 100% survival. If you took the Snake River dams or any of these dams out tomorrow, it doesn't mean that you, you're going to approach, you know, 100% survival. If survival at a dam right now is going through is 96%, you know, it's not like taking it out, it goes to 100. So, you know, you get an uptick of, you know, 1 or 2%, so you go from 96 to 98, but you still have predation and natural mortality out there. So is that 2% uptake that incremental change is going to be worth the social and, and, and <coughs> cost of taking these dams out. Uh, dams keep carbon emissions down and back up other renewables. Uh, dams are needed as sources of clean renewable energy, especially capacity, and that's the thing that really gets overlooked a lot in this. The cost to remove and replace dams and the navigation and lock system is extremely high and risky. You know, taking out dams, this, this isn't uh, any assurance to this. This is still an experiment. I mean, there's, there's nowhere out there that says, take these down, we're 100% guaranteed, salmon runs will come back. No, this is an experiment out there, and, you know, it may or may not result. In, but we, when we say, you look at all the other mortality issues out there, you know, this is no silver bullet. And it just doesn't make sense environmentally and economically to remove these dams. For, for some uh, up here, you may or may not remember in 1992, there was a uh, structural drawdown of the lower granite pool. So this is what uh, Lewiston looked like uh, back in 1992. Uh, this is, look, you're looking upriver, uh, down in here would be the dam going, or the dam, the bridge going from Lewiston to Clarkston. Uh, this is Snake River Avenue, a boat launch over here. And, you know, you're, you reduce the, the river going through Lewiston, you know, that channel reduces to about one third of what you would look at and see today. Uh, this is what it looked like at Memorial Bridge. You know, you just had a bunch of mud and muck through here and it turned Lewiston into a stinking mud hole during the, you know, 30 days the, the river system looked like this in Lewiston. Versus what it looks like today, um, you've got cruise ships in the background, there's uh, 27,000 visitors that that come up each year to Lewiston on, on, uh, on these different cruise lines that visit, visit the area. And we've got fishermen and people recreating on the river. And I appreciate your attention.